good evening, dear visitors, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our discussion, our small panel to the question, investigative journalism. I think you can hear me quite well. Ladies and gentlemen, today is the day of press freedom or the freedom of the press. In 1994, called for by the UNESCO, and the idea is that it's about where freedom of press is given is a place where democracy can actually live. And it's a coincidence that this day uh, happens to be today and this discussion is happening, but it works out quite well. It's quite fitting. Today we don't want to talk about fake news for a change. That is being discussed quite often. It's been done in the years back, and unfortunately you can say but we want to talk about the other side, the good journalism, about journalism that is uh, trying to find facts, uh, wants to reveal facts and explain them so that the audience will be able to understand them and be able to uh, shape their own opinion about these facts. And I think that's how we can uh, get as close as possible to what UNESCO was asking for. Investigative journalism isn't nothing, is nothing new. Uh, 1970s, remember, we, we remember Watergate scandal, that was a big chunk of investigative journalism which caused a U.S. president to step down. Uh, investigative isn't new, but in the last two, three, four years, there's new technologies and new techniques for investigative research. We have research networks that not only are organized nationally but internationally, and they work internationally. We have a lot of uh, newsrooms, specific task forces who are responsible for the research for the investigative part of it, where that is part of uh, their mission. We have data journalism, journalism that takes big data and tries to find uh, topics and tries to offer solutions. And those are all things that are not really new, but sort of new at the same time. And that's what we want to talk about tonight. We have here a group of colleagues uh, that know this field quite well. And to give you an idea about what this is about, I want to quickly show a spot, a short clip on the Paradise Papers. We are at the destination, at the goal. We had an amazing, breathtaking view into the world where profit is above all. For a year long, by done by journalists from all over the world, we uh, analyzed data from one of the biggest law firms in the offshore um, field. Uh, from their strategies, superstars are profiting. Millions of documents were given to the Süddeutsche Zeitung and were analyzed, and they reveal what used to be hidden. In one of the last standing tax oases, and I would like to introduce the panel, and I have a question, the same question for everyone. When we talk about these new instruments that we have here, research networks and research newsrooms, I want to ask the question, why is it necessary that, I mean, journalism was always investigative. So the first question goes to Patricia Schlesinger, to my right. She is the head of uh, the uh, public broadcasting of Berlin. Brandenburg, you used to work for Panorama. Uh, also with the RBB, you have an investigative uh, feature. And these TV features have always been investigative. What are the new uh, methods? What can they add? Uh, the, new, uh, the new methods, uh, you've named them. Um, data journalism, journalism, journalistic networks, smaller, bigger um, organizations that are 
responsible and working in this field, but the journalistic research, but also the investigative research. And that's why I want to be holding a little bit back. But it's, that starts in the local news. It starts with corruption of the mayor. It starts with bad public transport and the reasons for that. I want to I want to go back. I want to go back to the basic stuff. Investigative journalism is super important, especially for public broadcasting. It is our we have small and big firms that are looking for doing this job and we need to you have the political magazines that you've named them but there's the research that's done and there's why there's research networks of intern on international scale and Panama Papers is one of the best examples and it wouldn't have been done made possible without a big organization in the background but it starts in the small and at the core it is about revealing what is going on and, and point out mis, misbehavings. And the example, Georg Maskelov, is part of what came out of your troop. You're the head of the research troop for the WDR, Süddeutsche uh, Zeitung. Um, so the research things that you discover are being published through the really big channels, like two public, big public broadcasting channels and one daily newspaper. How did this uh, bound of connected people come about and why was that necessary? Um, there was always a good and uh, well co-working existing between these um, networks and newspapers and that's where the idea was born couldn't we make this a bit more steady uh, like couldn't we can't we build up on these good experiences that we've worked up and can't we do a little bit more and so we tried it out and up until today I think it's a very simple maxim that's guiding this should they work together shouldn't they work together for me the essential thing is is what comes out in the end good journalism or not? And that's what makes the difference. So on the day where I realized that's not true, I would stop doing what we're doing. And the example that we've seen here the, of the Paradise Papers is, of course, something unusual that we've done with the Panama Papers. There was uh, the German side of the research conglomerate and there was the BBC, Le Monde, the New York Times that were part of this. And what's the reason for that? Well, when you have 13.4 million documents that you're trying to understand and want to tell a story or fragment of this, if you want to talk about the global phenomenon of tax uh, hidings, you have to have a global journalism that uncovers this. And that's not just something that we have to look at in Germany, but it's you have to something that you have to look on the global scale. So if tax evasion happens on a global scale and you have to see the political dimensions of this and the hope that you can have to uh, show this misconduct and um, if that if you by making that visible you're kind of diminishing that and making that smaller and that's the goal that we had and let's hope that that's possible. Olaf Sundermeyer to also to my side a colleague from the RBB it starts in the local is what Patricia Schlesinger just said, and you are part of the new publishing team, editor team of investigation and background. Why was this one founded? Was there not enough investigative journalism? Well, you honestly have to say that this kind of uh, board exists a lot longer than the cool name that it was given in last year. The deciding factor is that we're not working on current news. We're not the evening news. We're not Radio 1. We're coming from the subject itself. We always have time. We work with colleagues in teams that have a little bit of an expertise to different topics, extremism, Islamism, um, the housing market in Berlin, and they're concentrated within us. And we're, we're building these subjects up and, and we publish them on day X when the subject is, is finished and ready to be published. And that goes to all sorts of different channels. And that can be the news or the lunch magazine. Like it's, We have the time to do this and we are not a classic newsroom. We don't have the pressure of production of having to publish on uh, at 8 p.m. every night. So that's something that we've built up over the last few years at RBB, and that's brilliant to see. Another 
newsroom that was built was BR Data, which is the Bavarian uh, broadcasting. Ulrike Köppen, you are the head of this newsroom. Also, question to you, why was this necessary? Oh, well, principally, it wasn't something that was built from the top down. We were allowed to grow. We were allowed to grow on our own and were then supported and got support from the back that it was, ne it was realized that it was necessary that we get people on board who understand larger amounts of data, who have ideas and knowledge about design. So we took people on that have a very different kind of education. So it was more a necessity or a feeling that it was necessary to have this interdisciplinary exchange. And that's how that team was built up. And all the way to the left is Oliver Schrum. He's sticking out a little because he's not part of a newsroom or a board or he's he's the head of corrective.org and that is a collection of journalists that write stories and research them financed based on donation that are then public being published and being published to be used for other things we're trying to be the answer to the question um, who can still afford investigative journalism. Um, and we have two big pillars of investigative journalism, or we used to. We had uh, the public broadcasting system that was financed by um, the public paying into that. And then there was major magazines that would be financed by uh, the sales and advertising and that kind of market is 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 crippling and it's going away so the 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 resource for investigation is 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 being cut back so that there's units that are building build up within the newsrooms is is pretty new and uh, i remember the discussion about this and the questions about this because investigative journalism is expensive. There's a whole stack of people who work on this for a year and at the end of it, the private publishers have to finance it and it doesn't finance. It doesn't refinance and the, the result is that the corrective is an idea from America. Um. It's maybe somebody who knows uh, here knows ProPublica. Uh, they exist since 2008, which was also a result of the crisis. Uh, there was uh, uh, some billionaire uh, who made his uh, money on the Wall Street, and the new, uh, news um, newspaper started to dying, and the Paul Steiger, the guy. Um, uh, said that he will give 10 million euro per year to the organization so we can make investigative journalists and you don't have to sell it you can just simply publish it and that's what happened and in 2012 when the crisis started in germany we wanted to try this to do some um some journalism which is financed by donations and we we also looked at ProPublica because there are our heroes and try to copy their model to Germany, but it's not that easy uh, because first we have another kind of donation system. There aren't that many um, very rich guys here, and we have the other problem that you can't be that journalism is not. Non-profit. No, a non-profit organization in Germany in general, and we um, had to learn it. So we do a lot of education because we um, it is necessary um, to do a lot of education to be a non-profit organization. Uh, organization. So we do do a lot of education. We have books. We uh, teach lessons, and this takes a lot of. Um, a lot of force and a lot of money, but we have to do it to have some number of status. And we have, um, at the moment, just political will that um, journalism is not um, non-profit. So, Georg Maskelow, how is the financial situation 
of journalism. Uh, of course, we understand that investigative journalism can take a, ve a very long time, and we don't know whether at the end there will be a good story. So, how does the finance uh, financiation work for you? I I think that you looked uh, around the Caribbean at different law firms and uh, to see how the status is. So, what did you? Do? I only agree with parts of the things I hear. I've been in the, in the same job for 30 years and always hear that there's not enough money. And I think that a lot of newspapers are financially well off in Germany. And I don't think that a um, public broadcast system is dramatically unfinanced. And a lot of the things we actually do um, is uh, what we call investigation is just classical, normal news journalism. Um, of course, we do things like oh, um, Panama Papers or to uh, continue the um, work by the murdered um, Maltese journalist. Um, but a lot of news stories we typically work with are just normal, uh, classical um, news journalism, something which is in the and the U.S. has another meaning to find out for the audience, which was unknown before, to, uh, to find new facts, uh, which enable the, the audience, the readers, to form their own opinion. And in Anglo-Saxon um, countries, uh, this has not a tradition. And I think that we do a lot of new or different journalism, and, and it will uh, is put on a um, podcast. And but I think that but I personally think that it um, should be in every um, newsroom. Uh, concerning the financial situation, I think that investigation, at least if it works, is the cleverest um, invest, um, invest, um, invest, invest, investment. investment you can uh, do. So look at The Guardian, for example, which was a few years ago um, a left-leaning, well-known uh, newspaper and with a lot of scoops, uh, first about uh, the U.S. government, then WikiLeaks, and then Panama Papers. Uh, it became a, a worldwide known uh, brand. If you ask the uh, editor-in-chief of Guardian uh, how much did it cost, what did you have to invest to get the, uh, the kind of uh, brand you have now, it's probably the best investment you could have made. And the idea that investigative journalism is just something that you lock yourself in in, in, in your office for a year and then you uh, get out with a story, but that's not true. A lot of uh, colleagues I know, for example, also in um, U.S. Um, newspapers are one of the well, most well-known. Um, the idea that it's only very large pro projects which take a long time or is just not true. Um, well, uh, colleagues with uh, well networks which have a lot of access are the ones who also appear at newspapers um, the most often. Olaf, I heard, I understood this different from you last year. Would you disagree that you need, yes, that you need a separate um, office without being under the pressure to uh, immediately have results? And um, we don't have at the RBB enough time to find um, new facts. We don't have to be in the daily news cycle. Um, there are, is, of course, journalism which isn't immediately investigative, which can appear every every other week and appear in the uh, evening news and then, for example, um, use new facts and explain them. And we often do or use our expertise um, to explain, for example, the 1st of May um, in other news networks, um, independent of features which appear, for example, in contrast to a news network. 
And so sitting in a locked office to just wait a year won't be allowed by your um, Frau Schlesinger. So is it a good in investment to have such a to have such a part of the office? Yeah, I, I think it's we have um, invested more money and time into this. Uh, Georg Maskell uh, said that it is the, one of the best investments you can do because um, well, it's good craftsmanship and you can show what it moves. It's like sometimes it's little stories. Sometimes it's only uh, a question of expertise and knowledge and sometimes something specific happens and there's a new sta radio station that wants to have a context. But a lot of times there's really good stories that come out like the Microsoft dilemma. Like that is a good, smart story. That was a tough story. For that you need time. And that is if you have the public broadcasters when they're not doing it, the others can do it and they have to do it and they do it really well and they're, they're investing and I think it's something that we have to put the money in. We have the money from the public, we have the money from our audience and that's where public journalism has to take place. And for me, the best journalism is investigative journalism to say it, put it generally. Georg Maskolo, I want to get to a point that might be a little bit more difficult or critical. In the international co-working, like with the Panama Papers, you work together with the consortium of uh, investigative journalism. It's about 200 colleagues. You uh, named the newspapers that are working all over the, con the globe. And this uh, is financed based on donation. And now it happened that in the Paradise Papers, while researching the uh, tax evasions and researching the tax havens, you found two of your donators who donated for that uh, consortium that were all of a sudden part of that list, George Soros and the founder of eBay. Um, how do you handle these kind of facts? Uh, isn't there a conflict of interest that suddenly uh, manifests itself? Come on, that you can read how read up on how we dealt with that, and I think uh, we handled it really well. Uh, we uh, obviously handled them exactly the way that we handled everybody else who was part of these papers and the scandal. I would have had a problem if we had uh, kind of found these people and stumbled across them and said, mm, oh, that's kind of awkward. We can't really report on them or let's build the, I'll give the theoretical example of there's a leader of uh, uh, part of the any of the broadcasters or of the newspapers that were part of the story, and oh, we're going to like not report on that. I think that's when you when you uh, devalue all your journalistic means and value. So in the Anglo-Saxon tradition, this discussion is nothing that comes about. Like this is you can see that up until today, the Washington Post has about Amazon and is is not going to change their reporting, even though they're owned by them, and luckily so. Whatever you say about Jeff Bezos and Amazon, he is not expecting that. He's not expecting to be treated different. The New York Times is owned by a Mexican billionaire uh, whose uh, details of his personal and professional life I want to kind of keep from you, but one of the toughest stories you can read about him, you can read in the paper that he owns. So uh, wherever you touch these points, these iffy points, where we kind of live in a time, and I would say that in a lot of moments, thank God, we have a critical audience, a more critical audience, that against um, back in the years would ask a lot more questions. Do you really apply the same standards to, that you apply to everyone? Are you applying those to yourselves? And I think too many times in the past we didn't do that. There's a whole different sensitivity that we have also amongst journalists that is growing, that sensitivity that's growing, that's addressing these problems. And I think in this particular case, we handled it well. There was two people, and who knows, maybe in the next uh, set of data, there's not going to be another five who are big donators as well. And with those stories, we also have to handle it exactly the same way, the way that the audience expects us to, and how our craftsmanship allows us to. A similar question to Mr. Schroen. So, because Corrective is fully funded by donation, 
there's no big publisher or broadcaster behind you. First question, do you see the fear or the danger of conflicts of interest and very concrete with Corrective? Can you explain to me why Corrective works for money for Facebook and what are you doing there? I do not see a conflict of interest because everything is being made transparent. When you work for a normal newspaper, you also get advertiser money. And there's obviously an editorial conflict when there's uh, uh, somebody who puts in money from the advertiser and is not so amused about the news that are being put on. But you have to just bear that. You have to... The, the, the advantage for of Collective is that we're not dependent on singular um, advertisers that give us their money. We have foundations, we have donations, we have members of donations, and we make that public and we show who gives us their money. And I want to quickly kind of contradict Georg Maskolo because he's not fully right. I'm afraid that the investment really pays off an investigative journal. Like, for example, Guardian is owned by a foundation, is refinanced, but they're not fully refinanced, and they have to take out of the foundation and they have to take money out. New York Times has a gigantic, does gigantic journalism every year. Hey, they have cutbacks, and that's the problem. It's not refinancing fully. And that's why the public broadcasters are so much more important than they were in previous years because the gap that, they're, they, that they have to fill is like they, 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 they're, the, they're the only ones that can fill that gap. Like Collectif or ProPublica cannot fill this gap completely. We can make it a little tiny bit smaller. And about Facebook, we have uh, another editorial board who's, that was just called uh, Really Now, and they do fact checks, and they do fact checks of fake news. That was before my time. I've, I've only started three months ago as editor-in-chief, and they've done this so far for without taking money because we didn't want to have that dependency on Facebook. But these fake news that come in through Facebook and we, my colleagues basically realize that there's no influence that's being taken from Facebook and for us it's a lot of effort and it's really expensive. There's a group of people that are sitting there that are doing fact checking every day and then it came about that we got to an agreement with Facebook and they would give us a certain sum of money and we'll make it public next year how much that is so I don't see a problem there. I don't know if everybody knows uh, what Collective is doing there. So there's a, an agreement with Facebook. If they come across fake news, they will check it, and then they will um, make a comment on that. They will notify Facebook. They will also make a notification on the pages of Facebook that this is something that's questioned. And within the algorithm, it's uh, being downranked so that these pages don't show up so much in the news feeds. It's a really kind of a good thing, but at the same time, it brings up the question in these days uh, where we are thinking very differently and talking very differently about Facebook, are you still happy about the collaboration? Oh, ouch. Uh, of course we were rethinking our decisions, but at the same time we came to the results. These fake news stories and checking these fake news and, and making public when they are fake is... You ha we have to really see how that relationship develops. Of course, it's something that we're regarding critically, and we're watching with a very like a hawk eye, and that's a problem that you will, however, face wherever there's finances. It doesn't matter if it's a donation or the public broadcasters. Uh, just look at who does advertisement before 8 p.m. The German, the Deutsche Bank, the farm, big farmers. Um, David Schrenk has just recently at a at a price ceremony said, "Thank you for being there, for being here. We take your money, and we're un and afterwards we're ungrateful." And I think that's a good general attitude towards this. When you look at the Washington Post, for example, it's another good example. Of course, they were almost dead, and now they're revived because there's a man who made his money questionably. How are you supposed to handle it? I think you have to make it transparent. You can't always pick who finances you. I wish it would be different. Maybe one more idea, one more thought. I think you have to let go of the idea that there's only good financiers. And without financiers, it's 
not going to be able to work. There's, I, I almost know no newspaper that only finances itself through journalism. Everybody's dependent on advertisement or big finances. Maybe Le Canal in France, who don't have advertisement, but they're, I think, one of the big exceptions in Europe. Maybe I have to in, in, uh, one, have to step in a big part of the problem, a big portion of the problems that the newspaper and the features and the magazines are, f are facing, that by century mistake, a century grave mistake, with the beginning and the, the success of the internet, a lot of magazines and newspapers thought that they would be able to be giving journalism away for free and then on the other side sell it at the same time. And everybody's trying to find a way back and dialing back. So wherever we're producing, whatever we're doing, if it's investigative, if it's daily news, if it's sports reporting, if it's a good theater critic or review, like local news, it's something that's not for free. Good journalism is not there for free. And to be stingy with your money is not sexy if you want to have reliable news and information. And on the other hand, everybody that are, is on this edge is trying to step back. And everybody who thought that you could only by clicking, clickbaiting and, and advertising driven journalism could be financed. This has turned out to be a completely wrong. Uh, a lot of a lot of a lot of problems to find models. Others go uh, go the way in a very impressive way. You see this at a lot of local, uh, regional, uh, regional newspapers. You can see it uh, at um, now at um, at the New York Times, which go with a clear message to everyone who who would who like uh, clear journalism, and it's not for free. And for every one of you, there will be the decision. You can always be uh, angry about the public broadcasts, about the daily newspaper, about the local newspapers. But it's important to inverse it, to think about what you would be miss out on if they are not there anymore. And I always think that while we make a lot of problems, you would miss a lot. And we have to go back to understanding that good journalism is worth its money and has to be paid. Uh, while good journalism is in a, a regional uh, verse, I will show you in a uh, quick film. The title is a large. Stuttgarter Platz. Stuttgarter Place. Uh, Base of Italian uh, uh, pitch pockets. And there are two. There are again here, both of them very great. Sven Lichtenberg is part of the uh, special commission and uh, specialized on special specialized on pitch pockets. The thieves are especially active near the uh, large S and U at um, tram stations. I was teaching everything by an older um, older uh, people uh, while I was active in the uh, foreign countries. They showed me everything words. Um, the um, thieves are just the funda fundament of the pyramid. Well, uh, Olaf Sundermann. Um, what the backing does, or um, editor room need, who does such uh, research? We already talked about um, even an office which has which has given a lot of time uh, has to uh, give results sometimes. Yeah, we have. I've participated in on this documentation, which has run on the ARD with a lot of. Um, we have played us um, because uh, the pitch pocket, which are we uh, reported on in Berlin, are also very active uh, in other parts of Germany, and it needs time. But we always um, accept the pressure while by giving a 
small um, parts and publishing them. Um, the colleague I talked about um, has made a documentation about the boundary region and boundary between Germany and Polish, and there was a documentation about the uh, Amazon headquarters near Stettin, which was um, which became important when Amazon was invited at Springer Publisher, um, where um, and then the colleagues at Tagen show showed um, short parts of it, but the colleagues could stay on the main documentation and work on it. And there are some expectations, and you, even on the colleagues, you want to know when does it come, when does your um, work come out, and we have to work here all the time, and what do you do? And we can respond with always publishing regional or locally relevant parts of it and not only have one documentation but all the time talk about um, small thefts and talk about how um, thefts and is increasing, the number of thefts is increasing um, so rapidly in Berlin and Germany is a theft of um, bikes, for example, and we started looking not only for this one documentation, but we looked but we looked at the topic of theft over a long period of time and to uh, made a lot of reports out of it when you talk about the backing for reporters there appears one problem there are a lot of great uh, good documentaries appearing um, published in the rd or rbb which were published by and if you step on the foot of the um, powerful, there you can be sued uh, regularly. And the producers of the film uh, complained about this a lot. And I heard that the RBB is one of three parts of the uh, RD who have found a different solution. What's this solution? Yeah, we found another solution with a lot of preparation. And we have to start at somewhere it's uh, small and medium, and even the large um, producers who talk about theft and criminals have always a problem, and this problem is increasing. The object of the research is, is acting against it uh, um, legally, and this can be a problem for uh, medium and small uh, interpreters. For example, if they fired against a Deutsche Bank, because even the threat of the suing, even without knowing whether it will be uh, successful, and um, can completely bring down such an um, enterprise. And additionally, um, and that's the reason why we work together with the NDR and the MDR to how we can support the producers. And we talked about with an organization of producers uh, who had the ideas. And there were a lot of legal reasonings I don't want to talk about. And at the end, there is uh, um, there is something which means that if a producer uh, worked journal journalistically very fine he can talk about it with us that and say that I'm going into um, attacking um, a large enterprise or a bank who are known for having a lot of lawyers who who will fight back and bring us down if it goes wrong and now we can say that we we accept the risk and we take the risk now and you don't have the risk anymore and that's exceptional this doesn't happen all the time and the, the producer has to work uh, fine so that's a very important part of this and we've done this now one time and there were a lot of problems as you can imagine and I've just mentioned the Microsoft dilemma which is the first um, documentary we worked where we worked with this system and 
It turns out this is important because we need these producers and we need these for the first idea. And if they say, well, I can't afford it if it goes wrong or even if it doesn't go wrong, but they can't defend themselves, it's important that we are there, that we are uh, at your side and we support you if, there are, if you are getting sued. And so the um, media's um, no tax responsibility. Rüge Köppen, I want to ask you if you think that you have enough moral backing um, in your uh, office and we have a small um, movie to uh, support the understanding what you do um, at the BRR. Uh, I think the name is um, renting of uh, bikes. Is this your phone number? Yeah. Is this your picture of your profile? Yes. These data are now uh, accessible for me uh, on the internet. Um, data of customers open in the internet. Uh, it's about a bike sharing. We have um, asked some people to test the um, bike sharing company Obike. Um, just uh, um, log in with your app, but what they didn't know is that their uh, data were uh, published un unsecured in the net. With uh, only a few clicks, uh, journalists have been able to find the data of a lot of people worldwide and even make um, movement pro profiles. Uh, is this where he just went along? I'm um, Miss Kuppen. I found this on your homepage, this, this sentence that I find quite beautiful, where you write, our research is data and document driven. Maybe before I ask my question, after the backing that you have within your newsroom, can you explain to us what is it exactly that you're doing, how you work, how you find the gold and data, and how you get that gold? Are there other examples? Well, there's a lot of examples of data journalism that there's a lot of different shapes of data journalism. In this case, there, it was about a data leak that my colleague Robert Schaffer found on with Obike. And in this case, it wasn't really about big data and analyzing big data. It was about understanding that you can see personal information, personal phone numbers, a movement of patterns, a pattern movements of people all over the world. And there's so many of these bike sharing and these things, these you get to endpoints of intersections and you can get clients' data publicly available there, not encrypted. And you can understand who drove where and and for that you need people that understand the matter in front of their face. You need to and then it's when you get to people where you have to have people who are capable of doing this. We're part of a group of journalists, programmers, people who have completely different backgrounds. We try to be as diverse as possible so that we can have different backgrounds and views onto one subject. And we try to uh, advance in the digital research. So we have the capabilities to gather big data and collect big data. That was not the case. We never were given a leak like the Panama Papers. With us, it's a lot more that we have to think about how can we access this data? How can we get this data? Like, for example, we had a rumor that the housing market was highly discriminating, especially since the refugee crisis, so that if you have a foreign last name, you don't really get access to apartments and you won't be able to rent one. So you all know that if your name is not Robert Miller, it might be a problem, but there's no facts about this. There was almost no studies done. So that's why we were like, how can we get this data? So then we found, build up a big, big case of data. We used bots to scrape the to escape the, the housing and rental market. So that we just send out a lot of requests to people who offer apartments, regular, uh, regular, um, and we had about 12 different profiles that we were uh, writing to. So there was always three profiles to any uh, tenant. And uh, so one of them had a German last name, the other one had a Turkish last name, and so on and so forth. And this database we built up, uh, so that we could uh, then uh, understand the data 
that we've gathered so that building up the database was part of the research. And for, in order to do that, you need this kind of newsroom and this kind of editorial team. And that's when you have these kind of team, you also have people that understand algorithms and have people that understand what uh, an appy uh, online can do and, and, and what the HTML code says or does in front of you, oh, all of a sudden you can see a phone number, oh, there's a, a, um, a profile of movement. Do you find the, the subjects yourself or by, by doing, uh, by looking, or do you uh, get other uh, people coming to you with requests? Well, most of the time uh, we uh, identify the subjects, the topics, and then other um, other editorial boards we, we take on and get them in as well and get them involved. So like our special cases, data analysis. And so we, we, we kind of do every subject. Like the beautiful thing about the Bavarian broadcaster and, and the, the, the ARD and this, the funny thing is that you have an expert in every news and they've like done work for 20 years in this field. And that's the person that we get on board with us as well. Ideally, we research together with that a team of experts, and we have the, the nothing, something new. That's also this: like we have a new structural change. We work together more with the BR research, so we have another uh, research task force that works together with us. Plus, additionally, with uh, expertise, editorial staff. So then we have a very interdisciplinary research team, and ideally, and that will lead ultimately to people being completely in the subject itself. And so we work together with TV and, and radio broadcasters so just so that we can then have it published in a broad sense. So you don't really have the, the pressure of um, justifying that this new task force costs a lot of money uh, place delivery now. Well, no, thankfully, no, we don't have that pressure. I think it's it's quite recognizable that we work long on these subjects and we uh, work together with it on with a lot of people. But there's a programmer, there's a data analyst, there's a designer, there's a journalist. But you realize that the output after that research is really big. So we obviously try to like uh, publish this quite broad radio, TV, web. Um, so that's what makes it worth it. And that's why we don't have to deliver constantly. But when we do deliver, let's make it as loud as possible. So uh, one of the researches or, that you did I really liked a lot, you could prove that Wikipedia, the description about uh, politicians of the German parliament were changed by one third uh, by accounts that come from the parliament. So to have more friendly descriptions uh, and add them in there as they were there in the beginning. And that happens anonymously, but at the same time, based on IP addresses, you can prove where the source was coming from and that it comes directly from the offices of these politicians. That was a quite neat uh, research. Um, I would like to ask you all, when we talk about this uprising of investigative journalism, I have the impression that it is also a reaction towards what's usually published on the internet and in social media in the recent years, that's fake news, um, that's campaigns that have nothing to do with journalism at all anymore. Is this impression true? And is there a chance to, with this kind of journalism that we like, that we think is good journalism, that we want to support, do we have a chance against fake news are we going to be able to uh, stand strong? A lot of questions at the same time. I believe that uh, the need for information of all people is increasing rather than decreasing, and that on a global scale. That's one thing. And at the same time, uh, getting information seems to not really be a problem anymore. The problem that we have today is to contextualize this knowledge, uh, to know that it is w the way that it's stated there, to uh, trust, to uh, know the, the, the truthworthiness and contextualize it. Who does that for me? Who interprets this meaning and why something's happened and what it does with me and my country and my family and how it applies to that? And that's why I think in your question, 
to answer it on go, like in the big picture, yeah, I do believe it's more important to have a clear big journalism that is important for news, that's important for investigative journalism. And we can feel that the desire is increasing and the need for dependable information out there is increasing. And the, I mean, the global, what's going on on the globe is like you, you, you have this feeling of you want to know why things are the way they are. Yeah, I think more than ever before it's important and that's why it's the core of our business that, to do investigative journalism and give information. And then we have a few more minutes, so I'll ask, open the, to the floor if there's people who have maybe one, two questions. Where is the, my nice colleague who, oh, where is the nice colleague with a microphone? She wanted to be here, but now she's not here anymore. Are you coming back? Uh, I'll stand here so everyone can see me. Um, I am from Russia and I'm a journalist for the independent Russian uh, newspaper. And one of uh, our correspondents worked for the um, together on the pen and papers. And in Russia, there was only new one newspaper who worked on this. And my question is for you, um, Mr. Um, Maskolo. I know that's impossible to. Uh, for one um, office to do all the research, um, and in Germany there have have been uh, more than one um, media companies, and I want to know whether there is no competition, and how do you decide who publishes what, and how do you handle the competition, and if there is no competition, then why? Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, we are very happy that you have been part of it. Um, that since you know the um, state in Russia much better than I do, uh, you know that is uh, very sad that it's hard to find partners in Russia and in China. You don't find anyone at all. And I want to say that if we talk about how investigative journalism changed, I think about that I was a uh, a reporter in, G in the GDR and the and the GDR always invested a lot of um, interest and time into um, making sure that the citizens didn't um, listen to public radio from the Western or read Western West um, newspapers. So for dictatorships, it's very important to control what the citizens. Um, can read or listen to. And what changed in investigative journalism is that nowadays you can talk um, report a lot about the corruption next to uh, President Putin, and he can't influence it or prevent it, even, the, even though he has a lot of influence in his own country. So how do we handle the competition that's probably the most asked questions when we started, and we are now in the fifth year. and always when we begin, if you begin with something new, there are two ways to do this. And first is to to build a lot of different groups to who discuss what can, could happen in the future. And then we, you talk about it two years and everything breaks up. And we did it the another way around. We just started. And we know that there will be a lot of problems along the way. But we believe that we can only continue if there are fast and good uh, journalistic um, results. And if there are these results, we'll find uh, along the way using the, something like good face clause um, to handle all the problems we en encounter. And I think we handled it really well. And um, you, you've heard that, uh, as said, goes. Um, Complaints from the radio that the newspaper comes on the iPad at seven, but um, the most listened to um, parts of the radio are later. So we made a lot of compromises and send out the newspaper later, and it turns out that it worked really well so far. 
and I will tell you that it only works with journalists who are interested in the results, uh, um, who are interested in the good product, who do it because of a love or, uh, and passion for their um, for their job, and who are uh, who. Um, he agreed that that they ignore all the lo um, small problems and um, not make these irrelevant problems. If you and if you reach this point where you say that you are only interested in the results of the research, um, it turns out at its moment it's very easy to handle these conflicts. So we have one last question over here, and then our time is up. Thank you. Um, I'm from Hungary, and I want to talk about something which wasn't present that far. We talked about the global and about the local um, stories. I would like to come back to the European level. Yesterday, the um, president of the Commission, Juncker, and introduced or presented the new uh, finance rules and the parliament and a lot of the, it's a lot of money and a lot of it comes from germany and oligarchs in uh, oligarchs steal more money from people than pig particles in the, on the Stuttgart pla uh, place could ever do. And this is something this is, which is present in the German society, or is it something the German society isn't, isn't foreign about? or that there is high-level corruption which hold up the um, authoritarian or the regime of Orban. And how do you reach the German uh, audience? Good question. Does somebody want to say something about it? Otherwise, I will just uh, take it as, an, as a um, call to to also look at uh, our next neighbors in East Europe, Eastern Europe, which will also be, uh, um, which will also start investigative researches uh, with your colleagues there. And um, if you allow me, we also speak about this, this, and we also have this discussion today on the Day of Press Freedom. Um, in Europe, we have had at least two, and in my home country, Italy, and there have been a lot of dead journalists in the last decades, and even more who can only work with police protections, uh, for example, Roberto Savliani. And what we try, and what is, I think is new, is uh, that yeah, in the case of the Maltese journalist and the Romanian and colleague, we have projects, all these all these who think they can prevent uh, research by killing journalists um, will, uh, will feel the exact opposite. They will feel that journalistic corporations, which are, by the way, uh, like, in the, uh, like in the Maltese case, without any competition. For example, we did it in our corporation and also at the Zeit, and we didn't even discuss five minutes about it, whether we want this, um, whether we want to exclude them because of co the competition. But we say whoever tries uh, to to prevent um, some reports by killing the journalists, they will um, feel that journalists from all over the world go to these places and then try to do what this one person 
couldn't um, uh, um, finish um, finish th their projects. This is a um, central idea of the Malta project, and I think it's a very important uh, signal to send that um, assassination command um, teams are not able to end uh, research about corruption, and I think. Uh, it's important to send a clear stop signal here. Thank you. Yeah, our time is up, and it's the end of our discussion. It's the um, Global Day of Press Freedom, as global, um, Masculo mentioned. I thank you for your participation at this panel. I thank you for the audience for their attention. And I was asked to say that the RBB lab is also present tomorrow. And at every full hour, there, is, there are interesting discussions. And you can watch it in the live stream on RBB 24. Thank you and goodbye.